Hello, welcome to the McGuffey's Online Tutor. Is there a black sheep in your family? There are four in Elaine Knudsen's. The 12-year-old 4-H girl from Petaluma, California is raising quadruplet lambs, two boys and two girls, all black. The babies lost their mother, and now they shy away from a wet nurse foster mother. What to do? Elaine has to bottle feed her woolly lambs, but she'll have four times as much fun when they follow her to school one day. Hello, welcome to the McGuffey's Online Tutor. Today we found you a supplementary video. It's actually a supplementary video for any lesson within the McGuffey series that is about sheep. Hope you enjoy. And I hope you learn about sheep. Each spring, along toward the end of June, in many of our western states, a huge migration takes place. Thousands upon thousands of sheep, ewes that have wintered in the valleys, and their lambs, born only a few weeks ago, are driven to the high mountain ranges for summer pasture. The scene takes us back to the very beginnings of recorded history. For ever since the Stone Age, men have herded sheep. The ancient Egyptians, Babylonians, Greeks, and Hebrews spun and wove wool in their homes. And wealthy Romans who wore togas made of wool were proud of their flocks. Over the centuries, there have been hundreds of breeds of sheep. But today, only a few are of commercial importance. At a very early date, Spain developed the Merino for its unusually fine wool and this breed has had more influence on the sheep of the world than any other. The modern Merino has been valuable in the semi-arid and rough ranges of the sheep country because it can walk long distances, stand extremes in temperature, and get along with little shelter, feed, and water. It has the deep-rooted flocking instinct that lets one shepherd watch over a large band. The Merino is one of the smaller breeds. Most of the skin folds that once characterized it have been eliminated in the so-called C-type or Delane Merino. Coming from the same basic stock as the Merino is the Rambouillet. It's also a fine wool breed and its size and ruggedness have made it valuable on the range. It has the same flocking instinct that is so pronounced in the Merino. Rambouillets are good wool producers and have quite good meat conformation also. The ewes are good mothers and excellent milkers. Rambouillet rams pass on their characteristics to their offspring in marked degree. In the American colonies, sheep were first raised mainly for wool, and until the middle of the last century, most of them were in New England and other eastern states. Then the search for cheap rangeland led the industry westward, and by 1900, the Rocky Mountain region had become the leading sheep section of the country. Today, about 70% of our sheep are in the 17 western range states. The rest are in small farm flocks scattered throughout the other states in the Union. Sheep pay dividends twice a year. The first being the annual wool clip. On the range, shearing is a mass production operation compared with the shearing of farm flocks, but in both cases, skill and experience are needed. Shearing time in the spring is set by the weather, and the fleece is not usually removed until the danger of cold rains and snow is passed. A good man can shear a sheep in remarkably fast time. His equipment works like a barber's clippers. No adequate substitute for wool has ever been found, and our armed forces rely heavily on wool for clothing. It's said that one cause of Hitler's defeat in Russia during World War II 
was that his troops, dressed in wool substitutes, could not endure the cold and remain effective fighters. Branding or numbering of sheep is done with a soluble paint or fluid that will come out when the wool is scoured. The use of ordinary lead base or tar paints may lower the value of the wool considerably. During the past 50 years, sheep raising has changed from a strictly wool business to a wool and meat business. The income from wool alone is not enough to be profitable, and well over half of the industry's income today is from meat sales. While the early Spaniards were herding merinos in large bands, the British were raising sheep in small farm flocks. The English breeds did not have the fine wool of the merinos or rambolets, and the British began early to develop a better meat-producing animal. An outstanding example of a meat-producing breed is the South Down, which has an almost ideal meat conformation, reminding one somewhat of the modern blocky beef steer. It's often pointed out that sheep are the only animals that make a prime product on grass alone. The popularity of the South Down is spreading westward. The lambs mature early and reach market condition at light weights. The carcass is a favorite where small cuts are in demand. South Down fleece is the finest of the medium wool breeds, but few ewes will shear more than six or seven pounds of wool. South Downs have been popular for crossbreeding in Kentucky and Tennessee. Another good meat animal is the Hampshire. It's a big, rugged animal of good meat type that's in demand for small farm flocks as well as for the big bands of the West. The lamb crop will run as high as 150%, meaning half the ewes will have twins, and the lambs grow fast. Hampshire rams are more widely used for crossing than the rams of any other breed. One of the fastest growing breeds is the Suffolk. They're active sheep and rustle well for food, besides being hardy. Stockmen in the Southwest have found that Suffolk stand the heat well, and there are flocks in most of the Western states. Suffolk ewes are very prolific, and they're good milkers, so their lambs are heavy at weaning time. They give an excellent carcass with a high dressing percentage. The small head and shoulders make lambing easier for ewes that have been bred to Suffolk rams. The swing in emphasis from wool to wool and meat makes body conformation important. Lambs will dress out a little less than either cattle or hogs, 45 to 55 percent saleable meat from a live animal. As you might expect, the two hind legs give the most meat on the average nearly a third of the dressed weight. Roasts and steaks are cut from the legs. The loin is good for 17 and a quarter percent of the carcass. This is where those fancy English lamb chops and loin chops come from. Next to the loin is the rib section, which gives us 12 and a quarter percent of the meat from the carcass. Rib chops come from this section, as well as roasts. 16% of the carcass is breast. We get roasts here, too. The shoulder and shank give us 18.5% of our saleable meat. Here's where those mock duck come from, along with roasts and Saratoga chops. The neck accounts for 3.25% of the weight.
This drawing gives an idea why breeders have been trying to develop good meat conformation along with good wool production. The American taste for lamb has not been developed as well as our taste for some other meats. Last year, Americans ate 73 pounds of beef per capita. We ate 62 pounds of pork apiece. Each of us ate 29 pounds of chicken. But the per capita consumption of lamb was only a little over four pounds. There's a tremendous potential market for lamb in the United States. Another good meat animal is the dorset. Both rams and ewes of this breed have spiral corkscrew horns. The yield of fleece will run about seven pounds on the average. The most striking difference from other sheep is the dorset's breeding habits. Ewes will come in heat late in the spring or early in the summer, and the ram will work a band of ewes in hot weather when most other rams rest in the shade. That means Dorset ewes will produce lambs in the fall. The ewes are very prolific and are the heaviest milkers of all the breeds. Dorsets are well adapted to hothouse lamb production and are popular in the east where the best markets for early lambs are located. The biggest of the medium wool breeds is the Oxford. It doesn't have the carcass quality of the South Down but it shears more fleece than any of the other medium wool breeds. 10 to 12 pounds is about average for an Oxford ewe, but some shear as high as 15 pounds of wool. The lambs are big too, 9 to 10 pounds at birth, and they grow fast. Oxfords have wool on the face, but not enough to cause wool blindness. The breed is prolific, and the rams are used on small ewes to produce bigger lambs and to increase wool production. A middle-of-the-road breed combining meat and wool qualities is the Shropshire. Its most distinctive feature is a complete wool covering, including the face and legs. It will shear perhaps 10 pounds of fleece a year. Shropshire ewes have a lot of twins and triplets, and next to South Downs, the lambs reach market condition as early as any other breed. The ewes are good milkers and produce active lambs that will weigh from seven to 10 pounds at birth. Shropshires are especially popular in the Middle Western states. The rams are often used on grade farm flocks. In an effort to correct a tendency toward wool blindness in the Shropshire, at least one breeder has imported from England a British-type Shropshire ram with a clean face. One of the prettiest breeds is the Cheviot, and wealthy people often keep flocks on their estates because they are so decorative. The Cheviot is one of the smallest breeds, but it also is one of the hardiest. It can stand cold, stormy weather, and being a hill breed is very active. The lambs are quite small at birth, from five to seven pounds. The Cheviot is a medium wool breed and will produce an average of about seven pounds of fleece. The ewe is apt to be a little nervous, but she's a good mother. Let's watch a flock of Cheviots being rounded up by a trained sheepdog. Dogs have always been both a blessing and a curse to sheep raisers but a well-trained border collie can be a great help and time saver. get to be so good at their work, they can exercise amazing control over the sheep. This collie, for instance, 
is going to bring in five skittish ewes from the distant pasture, herd them through a narrow gate, and then into a small enclosure. Let's follow along with the members of a breed improvement association to see some Corydales. The Corydale was developed by crossing Merinos and Lincoln. Line breeding and careful selection have produced a new breed with many of the desirable qualities of both ancestors. It was brought into the United States from New Zealand in 1914, and its popularity has spread remarkably since then. It was used first on the range and in the mountains, but has become a popular farm flock sheep in the Midwest and the East. The Corydale is a good dual purpose sheep, being a heavy producer of excellent medium wool, and it also gives a good meat carcass. A breed that has gained much popularity in the West is the Columbia. It was developed in the United States by crossing Rambouillets and Lincolns, and is now a well-established breed. It's one of the largest of the medium wool breeds and produces a valuable fleece. It has proved very useful under range conditions and is valued for its lamb production as well as for its wool. Of the 200 breeds of sheep that exist today, you've seen examples of some of the most popular. Each has its boosters, each its strong points. Each exists because a breed that is well adapted to the Middle West may not necessarily be best on a Texas ranch. And raising sheep on a Pennsylvania farm is quite different from raising sheep in the Rocky Mountains. A good example of Rocky Mountain sheep raising can be seen in Colorado. Nestled between the Sangre de Cristo Mountains on the east and the San Juan Range on the west, the San Luis Valley of Colorado offers a typical example of western sheep raising. Here, large herds are wintered on farms in the valley, and here the ewes have their lambs in the spring. Here too, as in other parts of the country, Valley sheep men depend on their friend, the Texaco man, for quality petroleum products. It's an interesting fact that high altitudes demand a different gasoline than low altitudes. To guarantee top performance, Texaco gasolines are changed to fit local climate and altitudes. Since lambing more than doubles the size of each herd, the problem of summer pasture becomes acute. And toward the end of June, the sheep are moved to the mountains to graze on government range land. The bands may number 2,000 head each. And for the week or 10 days of the drive, sheep have the right of way on the highways. Many of the bands walk all the way from the valley to the mountains. Some owners prefer to ship their herds by truck. Big two and three decker trailers that will hold two to three hundred sheep are used. trucks can make the run to the mountains in a few hours, whereas the walking bands may spend nearly a week on the trail. Since most of the government ranges are inaccessible by road, 
the trucks are unloaded and the bands finish the last few miles of foot. The ranges may be at altitudes of 12 to 14,000 feet, where men and horses have some trouble catching their breath, but the sheep don't seem to mind. Only ewes and lambs are permitted on the range. The shepherd faces a lonely summer on the range, caring for his band. Here, the lambs will grow and fatten on this high altitude pasture. And when fall comes, before the snow begins to fly, they'll be driven down to the valley again and shipped off to market. The leading sheep and lamb market of the United States is at Denver. setters in the industry. As many as 70,000 sheep may be received here in a single day. Not all the lambs received are slaughtered. Thousands from the range will be reshipped for further fattening on farms and feedlots. It's a peculiarity of the business that most of the lamb raised in the West is sent to the East Coast. There is a good market for lamb in California, but most of the lamb raised in this country is eaten in New York, Boston, and other large eastern cities. Sheep men usually don't need to count sheep to help them go to sleep, but they do count their herds regularly and become quite expert at it. Some count by twos and some by fours, and a helper keeps track of the hundreds. And speaking of counting sheep, it's a matter of concern that our sheep population is smaller today than it was during the Civil War. Australia, Russia, Argentina, and India all raise more sheep than we do, and we are forced to import 65% of the wool we need. During the past two years, the number of sheep in this country has increased slightly. But there is room for many more sheep, both on the range and in small farm flocks. It's often said that sheep return more per dollar invested than any other kind of livestock. They can utilize low quality forage not suited to other farm stock and can turn a profit on land too poor or hilly for farm crops. Sheep raising is one industry where there is no overproduction. Whether our sheep population will continue to grow is anybody's guess. But one thing is sure. As long as men farm the soil, some of them will raise sheep. 